In the previous video, I made the claim that Mark's Gospel was a deliberate work of fiction, based in part on Homer's Odyssey. Now, it's time to put my money where my mouth is. We'll spotlight some basic parallels first, and before we're done, we'll examine several of them in great detail. Keep in mind that it's perfectly normal to be skeptical, but like a good juror, please try to keep an open mind until all of the evidence has been presented, and that's going to take several videos to accomplish. In the Odyssey, we learn that Odysseus is a man who will undergo many sufferings, be set upon by rivals in his homeland, visit Hades, the land of the dead, and return alive to tell about it. Odysseus's future sufferings are foretold by Calypso as she tries to tempt him into abandoning his quest and staying with her to rule as an immortal. But if you only knew in your own heart how many hardships you were fated to undergo before getting back to your country, you would stay here with me and be the lord of this household and be an immortal. Although Odysseus finds Calypso more beautiful than his wife Penelope, he longs to return to his wife and his homeland of Ithaca. What I want and all my days I pine for is to go back to my house and see my day of homecoming. And if some god batters me far out on the wine blue water, I will endure it, keeping a stubborn spirit inside me. For already I have suffered much and done much hard work on the waves and in the fighting. So let this adventure follow. Odysseus says that no matter what hardships may follow, he will endure them in order to get back home. This reminds me somewhat of Jesus' resolve in the Gethsemane scene. No matter if the hardship is even death, Jesus was resolved to go through with it to get back to his heavenly home and to accomplish God's plan of salvation. In Mark, we have Jesus predicting his own hardships and suffering. And like Odysseus, Jesus would visit the land of the dead and make it home alive. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Here, Mark not only used a parallel theme, but he has improved upon it. For even after dying, Jesus will come back from the land of the dead as Odysseus had returned alive from Hades, the Greek land of the dead. We will continue to see Mark improve the scenes and motifs he copies from the Odyssey, as this was one goal of the fiction writers of ancient times, mimesis with an eye toward improving upon the previous tale. Now, some of you may have been thinking to yourselves, these basic parallels are okay, but not completely convincing. Where's the beef? Well, to those of you who are hankering for something a bit more filling, I hope you brought an appetite and some steak sauce. In the Odyssey, Odysseus's identity is often cloaked so that his friends and family don't even know who he is, even though they are speaking directly to him. This hidden identity technique is a recurring motif in the Odyssey, and of course, it's merely a literary technique employed to create irony. The reader knows full well who Odysseus is, but the people inside Homer's story with whom he is interacting do not. In one of the most memorable scenes in the Odyssey, Odysseus, disguised as a beggar, enters his own home and his old nurse, Eurycleia, begins washing him. She thinks he is just a beggar until she notices the scar which allows her to recognize the stranger as her master Odysseus. She is so overjoyed that she wants to tell Penelope that her husband has returned, but Odysseus warns her not to tell anyone. My good mother, why this wish to have me slaughtered? You yourself nursed me at this breast of yours. Now in the 20th year, after undergoing numerous ordeals, I've come back to my native land, and now you've recognized me. A god has put that in your heart. Stay silent, so in these halls no one else finds out. I'd like you to keep a couple of things in mind as we examine Mark's use of Homer's hero-in-disguise construct. 
The basic construct is this. A disguised hero interacts with friends and strangers, and when he is recognized by someone, he warns them to be silent and tell no one else of his true identity. The implication is that if he is found out prematurely, the hero will be placed in some kind of special danger. In Mark, Jesus' identity as the Son of God is hidden from the other characters, and even from his own followers for a while. Even though Jesus is speaking directly to the Jewish leaders, who are analogous to the suitors in the Odyssey, they do not recognize him as the Son of God. This creates irony. Just imagine the Christian readers of Mark's day and how they must have smiled to think of the Jewish leaders trying to lecture the very Son of God about the Mosaic laws. That's irony. And as we shall soon find out, Mark takes Homer's hidden identity technique to its limit. In several passages, Jesus tries to maintain his secrecy by telling those whom he healed not to mention the miracle to anyone. And he sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. And immediately the girl got up and walked. She was twelve years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. Mark makes Jesus command everyone to keep mum about his true identity so that Mark can have ample opportunity to employ irony throughout his tale. Once Jesus' identity gets out, the irony from that technique is lost for the rest of the tale. And with overly contrived adherence to the hidden identity theme from the Odyssey, Jesus even commands the demons to be mute, lest they blurt out his true identity to everyone and derail Mark's irony machine. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God! And he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. Earnestly warned the demons? I would have thought that the very Son of God would be able to simply shut the demons up if he truly didn't want his identity leaking out. Further, what difference would it make if people knew he was the Son of God? Isn't that what you want to happen? Wouldn't that help people to believe in him? Wouldn't that have helped spread the news of his miraculous advent worldwide? All of this secrecy seems a bit too contrived until we realize that Mark was superimposing the hidden identity motif from Homer's Odyssey onto his own fiction. And oftentimes, it just doesn't work quite as well. Jesus earnestly warning the demons not to tell people who he really was? Come on, man. Then, after eight chapters of miracles, teachings, and parables, Jesus asks his disciples who people think he is and then who they think he is. Peter finally manages to put the pieces together and says, You are the Christ. Well, duh. And immediately, what does Jesus warn them not to do? And he warned them to tell no one about him. But as a quick aside, let me hearken back to Odysseus' warning to Eurycleia. Do you remember how Odysseus said that a god had put her recognition of him in her heart? That is precisely what Jesus says to Peter in Matthew's version. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Is it possible that Matthew also knew of Homer and was using the Odyssey to actually embellish Mark's version? Just more food for thought, and this is not the only instance where Matthew does embellish with details from Homer, but let's get back to Mark. In the seventh chapter of Mark, Jesus heals a deaf man with a speech impediment by putting his fingers in his ears and spitting, then touching the man's tongue and saying the magical phrase, Be opened! 
I was almost expecting open sesame, but anyway. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And in the very next verse, what do you think Jesus warns them not to do? And he charged them to tell no one. You see, if Jesus' true identity got out, it would destroy all future chances for ironic encounters in Mark's story. So Mark must maintain Jesus' secret identity at every turn in order to increase the number of ironic encounters. Then we come to Jesus' transfiguration. And after six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up onto a high mountain, apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. After the transfiguration, take a wild guess at what Jesus warns James, John, and Peter not to do. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. By now, you should be able to see the fictional nature of this deliberate effort by Mark to keep Jesus' identity a secret. Mark wants to keep the secrecy going for the length of his story, or at least until Jesus explicitly spills the beans in front of the high priest. And by maintaining Jesus' secrecy, like in Homer's Odyssey, at the expense of clear contrivance, it buys Mark the maximum amount of ironic encounters. At every turn, the disciples, the Jewish leaders, the general populace are asking themselves, who is this man? Of course, the reader knows and was no doubt reading along thinking to themselves, I know, I know who he is. The hidden identity motif remains in place until Jesus finally lets the cat out of the bag in front of the head Jewish religious leader, but the secret Mark's readers already knew created the same effects between Jesus and the Pharisees as it did in the Odyssey between Odysseus and his antagonists. If the suitors in the Odyssey had only known they were talking to the guy whose house they were currently in and trashing, if the Jewish leaders had only known they were talking to the very Son of God and trying to lecture Him on the Mosaic Law, we can clearly see the fictional transparency of this literary technique borrowed from Homer and religiously employed, excuse the pun, by Mark for the sole purpose of creating irony just as Homer did. This also explains a particular plot hole in Mark's story. Why the chief priests needed help in identifying Jesus when Jesus had been appearing openly in public and debating the Jewish leaders in the synagogues. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Odysseus cloaks his identity on many occasions and he is then able to eavesdrop and hear what others truly say about him. But this is unnecessary when it comes to the suitors of Penelope, the guys ransacking Odysseus' home, because Odysseus has been gone for years and they had no idea what he looked like, and even uncloaked would need someone to inform them of his identity. The suitors in the Odyssey are analogous to the Pharisees and Jewish high priest in Mark's gospel, the enemy, as it were. The suitors had no way of identifying Odysseus without help. And likewise, though Jesus allegedly appeared in the synagogues and preached in front of everyone openly, the Jewish leaders still needed a bit of help in identifying Jesus. This obvious plot hole was caused by Mark taking the hidden identity motif of Homer a bit too far in his zeal to improve upon the master. In the next few videos, we'll look at some more basic parallels as well as show how Mark's reliance upon the Odyssey and Greek mythology illuminates some oddities found in Mark, which both Matthew and Luke chose not to include in their rewrites. We'll also examine several of these parallels in great detail. So come hungry and get here early. The main course is yet to come.